Already recognized as kings of their domestic game, Portuguese giants Benfica arrived on the global stage in 1961, when they became only the second team to win the European Cup. The following year, they successfully defended the trophy, and over the course of the decade, they lifted eight Portuguese league titles and three Portuguese cups. Spearheaded by Eusebio, the Benfica of the 1960s created a legacy that ranks them among world football's elite clubs. Playing for any club as big as Benfica, as great as Benfica, made life easy for me. The club has everything. Benfica were a top side. The majority of the players had matured together, and during that time, the team were fully confident of their chances. All this was achieved due to the fact that they produced the first generation of great players in Portuguese football. Hungarian Bela Gutmann joined Benfica in 1959 from rivals FC Porto. He had attracted plenty of notice in a nomadic managerial career that had seen him take charge of 14 teams in nine countries over 26 years. But it was in Lisbon that he would enjoy his greatest successes. He had a massive influence in the organization of Benfica as a club, and later on also of Portuguese football. He was a very practical man, very clear in his psychology, his mental preparation. He was ahead of his time. For instance, Mourinho today says the same things as Bela Gutmann said 50 years ago. One of the new coach's earliest decisions was to sack 21st team players and promote several promising youngsters. Antonio Simoes was still with the club's junior team when Gutmann arrived. He told his assistant, Fernando Callado, this young lad next year has to play with the big lads. He needs to play with Costa Pereira and Coluna and Aguas because he's nothing else to learn here. Gutmann's first season in charge put the club in contention with Sporting for the championship. Jose Augusto figured dramatically in a game late in the season that tipped the balance in Benfica's favor. Benfica versus Sporting. I remember it perfectly. We won 4-3. I scored two goals, one from the penalty spot, the other from a header that went past the keeper. It was a great victory and one that gave us great memories. Benfica's 10th domestic title had earned them entry to the following season's European Champions Cup. They showed they belonged in club football's greatest competition. Steady progress took them to a semi-final clash with Austrian club Rapid Vienna. Benfica had won in the Stadium of Light 3-0 and had practically secured victory, although 3-0 was not a guarantee because back then teams scored a lot of goals. A stormy second leg in the Austrian capital followed. Benfica played well and took the lead with a goal from Aguas and only conceded the equaliser towards the end of the match. In the last minute, they tried to make the referee award a penalty. The referee didn't think it was a penalty, and the game just ended like that. The fans were furious. The final was against Barcelona, who were already seen as a great team because they had beaten Real Madrid.
Benfica, at that time, were full of unknown players. And so that reinforced the feeling that Barcelona were the favourites to win. Barcelona at that time were on a level with Real Madrid. They were one of the top European clubs and the respect that other clubs had for them was um, immense. The Spanish goal from Cochich. Benfica got lucky during that period. They managed to respond well and were level at 1-1 through José Aguas. And then it was 2-1, an own goal by Gensana, which also involved the goalkeeper Ramelet. Mario Coluna added a third before Zoltan Sibor's consolation goal. Benfica held on and achieved the victory. And it was a win no one could believe against the mighty Barcelona. Benfica had become only the second team to lift the European Cup, breaking the monopoly of the previously invincible Real Madrid. Predictably, the Portuguese title was retained. Thus began the most glorious era in the club's history. They would be European Cup finalists five times in eight years. José Altofini's AC Milan faced Benfica in one of those finals. Oh, it was such a strong team. They played really well. Eusebio was fantastic, so quick and powerful. Their right winger, José Augusto, was everywhere. Simois on the left wing was really quick. Their keeper was great and also played for Portugal. They had great players in central midfield and their defence was very strong. Costa Pereira was Benfica's last line of defence for 13 seasons. He was an excellent goalkeeper. There's no two ways about it. But he was also a man of small contradictions. He was quite an insecure person. His Achilles heel was that he used to get so nervous before games that he would have to take a tranquilizer to be calm enough to play. Kavan could play in several different positions, eventually settling into the defense. He had two great feet. He was an excellent defender and a great character within the squad. Lisbon-born Germano was an unflappable figure. Before Beckenbauer there was Germano, very subtle, intelligent, technically superb. He had the ability to take the ball from the opponent without even touching him. Simply an extraordinary player. Fernando Cruz was a solid, versatile defender. All the games were important to him. He played all of them in the same relaxed manner. Varied threat and attack was Benfica's most remarkable quality. Sandro Mazzola's Inter Milan knew plenty about their strengths, having met them in the 1965 European Cup final. It was a team which had two great players, Coluna and Eusebio. Coluna was the director of the team, the soul of the side, as he was a few years older than Eusebio. Mario was what we called the boss. With his personality and control, he could really dominate a game, which impressed all of us. When the team was under pressure, he had the mental and physical ability to lift up the team and take that pressure off. He was able to carry the ball 30 or 40 yards and take away the pressure they were putting on us. He was a pivotal player who made his mark on all these successes achieved during the 60s. 
Santana was a vital supplier to the strikers. We were very good at providing that final ball, crosses into the box and assists. He was also a very good finisher. He was a very intelligent player, a great player. Benfica were blessed with an abundance of attacking talent. Jose Augusto regularly contributed goals from the right wing. He was very quick. One on one, he was very dangerous for the defenders. And he had great ability as a goal scorer. In his first year at Benfica, he scored 27 goals from the right wing, which is quite extraordinary. Jose Aguas was what I call an attractive player, a refined player. He captained the team to become champions of Europe twice, a focal point and a great player for Benfica. Outstanding on the left was Antonio Simoes. I was very fast, uh, a dangerous player when playing one-on-one. -on -one. I was able to dribble. Then I matured over time, even though I ended up losing some of my daring spirit. I was a great player who contributed to playmaking, to serve the team, etc., etc. He was an amazing player. Benfica has always had good left wingers, but Simoes, for me, was the best of the lot. He was um, a great colleague, uh, a friend to his friends, always ready. The jewel in the Benfica crown was Eusebio. Ex-Brazil international Bauer had spotted the teenager playing in the Portuguese colony of Mozambique and recommended him. Bela Gutmann had complete trust in Bauer, so Benfica decided to go ahead and sign me. And they even ended up paying more than agreed originally. The Black Panther, as he came to be called, broke all club goal-scoring records over the next 15 years. By the time he left Benfica in 1975, Eusebio had amassed 638 goals in 614 games. Eusebio was, for several years, one of the greatest players to have ever played the game. I'd go out on the pitch very relaxed, just enjoying the football. I never suffered from nerves. I just loved playing the game. Well, to talk about Eusebio is quite easy or perhaps difficult, as I'm not sure there are sufficient adjectives to define what Eusebio was. Besides being a great player, Eusebio was a born athlete. There was a group of elite players, footballers like Cruyff, De Stefano, Pelé. I think Eusebio was in that generation of players, a great player who was above everybody else. And I had the great privilege to know him and to have a good understanding with him on the pitch. I'd like to go out there showing that I wanted to win, that I wanted to score. I like to play football the way it should be played. Eusebio was the best of them all. Eusebio is the greatest ever Portuguese football player and one of the best in the world. In 1961 and 62, Benfica were just on another level. They were an incredible attacking force. In the 1961-62 season, English champions Tottenham Hotspur stood between Benfica and a place in the European Cup final. We'd won here 3-1 in the Stadium of Light. We really should have won by a bigger margin. The first goal was scored by Simoyas. Augusto added a second before clinching the win with 26 minutes left. The players arrived in London for the return leg, which proved an altogether different proposition. I confess we had a bit of luck there, especially because we scored first. But I remember the noise, the drums, the stadium. Tottenham went ahead with a penalty just after half time, but Benfica held on for a 4 3 aggregate win. Amsterdam was the setting for the final against Real Madrid. Back in Africa, 
We'd always dreamed about playing against Real Madrid. We'd heard of them, champions of Europe, and of course, De Stefano. Oh, he was my hero. We entered the pitch, the teams side by side. I looked at Di Stefano, Puskas, Kento, and all the others in awe and admiration. And I realized then that I am actually playing against them. At that time, Real Madrid had great players. Puskas, Di Stefano, amazing players. But then we were a very young team and we also had our qualities. We weren't the same as them physically because we weren't as old as they were. In a breathtaking first half, Ferenc Puskas gave Real the lead. Five minutes later, the same player made it 2 0. Aguas pulled one back and Cabem's superb strike leveled the score. But Benfica still trailed lifetime European champions 3-2 ahead. At half-time, Bella Goodman spoke to us about everything. Everything, that is, except tactics or what we had to focus on. But he spoke with such sense that it really influenced us. I remember Bella Goodman in his own special language, a, a sort of mix of Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, telling us, Mr. Sit down, Mr. Sit down, Real Madrid tired, Real Madrid old, 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 they cannot win, Real Madrid cannot run. Di Stefano dead, dead. That moment really struck us. If we score three or four goals, then we win. The conviction with which he spoke to us was truly amazing. We really had the belief that we could win the game. Mario Coluna equalized before Eusebio made his mark scoring twice in five minutes to cap a He was key to the way we played, and through him, we started scoring goals. And we felt that with every single goal we scored, Real Madrid were wobbling. It was definitely a special moment. I think at that moment in time, I didn't fully grasp the significance of the whole thing, of that final. That victory signified the establishment of a great club in European football. Benfica winning against Real Madrid meant that the club was known all over the world. An incredible game. And it will remain in history as one of the greatest European Cup finals. Back on home soil, Benfica added the Portuguese Cup. Eusebio set them on their way to a comprehensive 3-0 win over Vitória de Setúbal. That season also marked the end of Bela Gutmann's reign at Benfica. I think this is the most I can produce for football Portuguese. So now you go for a new challenge? Yes, I'm going out. Having fallen out with the club president, Gutmann left with the warning that Benfica wouldn't win another European trophy in a hundred years. I'm sure if he was around today, he wouldn't say such a thing, like Benfica wouldn't be a champion again. Sometimes people say certain things in the heat of the moment. But unfortunately, once again, Bella Gutmann was right. The next season, the Portuguese title was regained and a third successive European Cup final was reached. AC Milan were the Wembley opponents. Though Eusebio struck early, two second-half goals from Altafini took the cup to Italy for the first time. 
I remember that Rivera intercepted the ball in the centre circle for my second goal. I got hold of the ball and did the rest on my own. When I took my shot, the goalie got a hand to it and I knocked in the rebound. Benfica bounced back by completing a domestic league and cup double in 1964. In the final of the Portuguese Cup, Porto were routed 6-2. It was a match where Benfica played with inspiration and attacked well, which is reflected in the six goals. During that time, we were really on form. We were confident of winning, and we won with some ease. Two José Augusto goals and a penalty from Eusebio gave Benfica a 3-1 half-time lead. Then Simoes joined in after 48 minutes. I remember very clearly the ball was headed back from the left and luckily I came in from the right and scored with a header. Further goals from Serafim and Torres underlined captain Mario Coluna's right to lift the trophy. Huge crowds cheered Benfica's free-flowing football at the Stadium of Light, contributing significantly to the club's success. To play against us in the Stadium of Light was like being in hell. The Benfica supporters, throughout all periods of time, have been the biggest mass of people in the world. It has been a tradition that has been passed on from fathers to sons and on to grandsons. And the supporters of the club have always been the 12th man. And here we are still. The players were also keenly aware of their own role as history makers. There's no magic wand in football or in any other aspect of life that can create success. You need to have the talent, be good enough and have motivation, commitment, pride, etc. And that generation had all of that. The attitudes of the players back then means they would also have a place in the setup of teams now and those in the future. The fact that Benfica has this history shows that we have a culture of success. That is the history of the club, so it gives them the sense of responsibility and motivation that playing for Benfica means to win. The 1964-65 season was an exhibition of domestic supremacy. In winning Portuguese title number 14, Benfica blew away all their rivals. The challenges of Sporting and Porto were both... Cup semi-final, Vassas were beaten narrowly in Hungary and slaughtered in Lisbon. Five nothing was the aggregate. The opposition in the final would be holders Inter Milan at their own stadium. We beat them at home, at the San Siro. Their goalie got injured and they were down to ten men. And back then you couldn't make substitutions. Jair's goal just before half-time kept the trophy in Italy. Another Portuguese title in 1967 meant a further chance to add to Benfica's two European Cups. And again they reached the final, where Manchester United would try to become England's first European champions. I think it was a very even game for 90 minutes. Benfica had a team equivalent to Manchester United. We cannot forget the players United had at that time. But during extra time, things didn't go well. Jaime Gratz's goal hardly mattered as he went down 4-1 after extra time to a Bobby Charlton-inspired Manchester United. The domestic title race had gone to the last game, but an 8-0 defeat of Varzim sent Benfica over the line in style. Twelve months later, Benfica were Portuguese champions for the eighth time in ten years. Another Portuguese cup was added, Simoes in Eusebio scoring against Académica de Coimbra. The 1960s ended as they had begun, with Benfica lifting a major trophy.
A decade of constant success assured them of permanent recognition as one of the game's great clubs. We do not set ourselves any limits. Benfica will always be regarded as the team of that era. History tells us that the most important time for the club, the best time, the heyday for Benfica, happened in a generation of which I was privileged to be a part. The biggest factor of that decade in winning the titles that we won was down to the everyday relationships between the players. There was always a great spirit in the group because, after all, we didn't just play for Benfica, but also for Portugal. For me, it was truly a great privilege, and I am really proud of that time. I don't have red eyes, but I do have a red heart.